Well, welcome tonight. Uh, my name is Catherine Foster. I'm the executive director of New Winston Museum. May I see a show of hands how many people are here for the first time? That is wonderful. Well, I welcome you back to spend some time and, and sink in this lovely exhibit that we have here. This School to City is a celebration of the 50 years of North Carolina School of the Arts in Winston-Salem. And we have both of our curators here, uh, Dr. Mike Wakeford and Chris Jordan back there. Uh, Chris is our Director of Education and Programming. And we have another staff member over here, Alana Meltzer Holderfield, uh, is uh, in our, our development manager, so welcome. Um, your presence here today is important to us on a variety of levels, and we hope it's the start of, you know, an ongoing relationship here at the museum. Uh, we are laying the foundation of this institution, and we can use all hands that we can on deck. And so uh, I invite you to become a member of our uh, membership society. Um, you can find information, you can come talk to me about that. But also, we need help, you know, kind of deciding who we are and, and developing programs and exhibits for our future. So we have all kinds of committees. We have a program committee, an exhibit committee, um, we have fundraising committee, and I know several of you are really great at that. Um, so I welcome you to, to come help <laughs> us uh, build this facility. Um, join us next Thursday at Aperture Cinema in downtown Winston-Salem at 7.30 for the premiere of our Made in Winston-Salem film series. As you can guess, we're showing films that were made in Winston-Salem, and we're kicking it off with The Trials of Daryl Hunt, which was an HBO documentary that uh, looked at um, kind of the long, drawn-out process of exoneration uh, for Mr. Hunt. After the program, we're going to have a panel with um, Mark Rabel, who is the director of the Innocence and Justice Clinic at Wake Forest School of Law, and Phoebe Zerwick, who's the award-winning freelance writer and investigative journalist that uh, kind of brought a lot of issues to light and reopen the case. Um, so it'll be a lot of fun. Now, to introduce our presenters tonight. Um, Erlene Harmon is a government official and community activist of hired regard. And while I'm unable to share the entirety of her experience in this community, uh, I'll share some highlights of her career. A native of Buffalo, New York, Senator Department is a former member of the U.S. Army Reserves and received her B.S. in Business Administration from Winston-Salem State University. Having served five terms in the North Carolina General Assembly House of Representatives, she won the North Carolina Senate District 32 and was the first African-American state senator from Forsyth County. In 1982, she founded Lyft, Learning is Fun Too, Learning Center and Academy, where students uh, who were considered to be at risk were given a second chance to excel, and she served as executive director there. Elected to state office in 2002 and representing House District 72 in Forsyth County, she co-sponsored a successful bill uh, with fellow Forsyth County legislator Larry Womble that repealed the state's controversial sterilization law. She also fought vigorously for the death penal mo penalty moratorium. Uh, let's see, during the 2007 legislative session, she and Womble co-sponsored and championed the enactment of the, the resolution 1311, which expressed that the General Assembly's profound regret for um, slavery. Um, and she had that signed into law. Um, Let's see, on May 8th in 2010, Winston-Salem State University conferred upon her the honorary Doctor of Laws for her leadership and passage of the Racial Justice Act. Parman is a member of the uh, Psi Mega chapter of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority and an Associate Minister of Exodus United Baptist Church. Earlier this year, Parman resigned her position as State Senator and began in the position of the Director of Outreach for Congresswoman Alma Adams in the 12th Congressional District. Sorry, it's a lot to share. Thank you so much. <laughs> Will Cox has been an activist and worked in the medical and domestic violent fields for over 20 years. His advocacy work includes fighting for fair housing, civil, medical, and labor rights, amongst other issues. Will was active in the Occupy Wall Street movement and was successful in applying for and securing the North Carolina Highway Marker in Winston-Salem commemorating the civil rights unionism of Local 22. Will is currently a board member for Healthcare for All North Carolina and a universal healthcare advocacy organization. Please join me in welcoming our guest tonight. Okay, 
Yeah, is that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, In the early part of the 20th century, Winston-Salem was a bustling town. It was a town that was developed and built off of tobacco. There were three main ruling class families in Winston-Salem, the Haynes, the Grays, and the Reynolds family. And together, they were a ruling class. All the decisions that mattered in Winston-Salem were made on the executive floor and in the boardroom of, of, of the Reynolds building. And you recognize how damaging Jim Crow was and restrictive. Uh, if you were black, you just couldn't do certain things. Not only did you have the segregation continuing, but the economic exploitation of people working like dogs in these factories for very little money. It allowed uh, Reynolds and the stockholders to amass uh, this uh, huge fortune. One of the most remarkable stories is the, the mobilization of this African-American workforce in the tobacco industry into a union called Local 22. It was a very different and a much broader vision of unionization that had been attempted before. As I'm traveling through this land, I remember me. They knew that trying to bring a union into R.J. Reynolds. That was like David taking on Goliath. Local 22, I think, laid down a great foundation of activism. They led in the election of the first elected black official in the southern United States against a white candidate since the end of Reconstruction. This union became a vehicle, not just for some kind of economic improvement, but even more importantly, a vehicle for their emancipation. They called them communists and all sorts of other names to keep the community divided. The big push for the development of the African-American community here politically and economically was the starting of Local 22. They were caring women, uh, they were strong women, uh, and wanted to make a change. It was one of the, uh, I think the key moments for uh, democratic participation in the South uh, that preceded the, the Civil Rights Movement. It wasn't black funeral directors, it wasn't black preachers, it wasn't black insurance executives. Okay, just to give you a little background there, uh, Jonathan Michaels, um, the fellow that put this together, um, he uh, ended up writing an article about uh, Local 22 and the marker that uh, we had celebrating um, that uh, struggle that the uh, tobacco workers took on. And um, that article is on the front page of the journal. And I think that's a really interesting and a fitting thing because um, besides putting this together, putting that article out, I think it had some impact. Um, and uh, the journal responded by making a formal apology which is, uh, is a really interesting um, thing since the journal had really taken uh, a major role during the time of um, the union drive in Winston and Local 22 and trying to defeat the union. And they had a, a former FBI agent on the payroll and that was, his job was not just as a journalist. Um, that, um, that same fellow had also uh, written uh, quite a few articles in favor of um, the forced sterilization he was in, in Genesis. So um, anyway, this guy, I think he, Jonathan put, put together a great um, little video. We used that kind of as a promo video that we had at Aperture to uh, kind of get the word out about the marker celebration. Um, 
So just to give you a, a little background, most of you all probably know a little something about that there was a union drive here. You wouldn't be here tonight um, back in the 1940s. Um, and to put that maybe in some context, um, what was going on at that time, um, that there was a huge transformation going on, especially in the South, um, where the South was moving from an agriculturally based economy to an industrial economy. And um, during that, it meant that African Americans were also moving from predominantly being in the rural, uh, a rurally based um, group to primarily urban and proletarian working class wage earners. Um, and you see that there's a migration, which some of us have you know, heard that term, the great migration, and there's, you know, African Americans are moving um, to where these jobs are. And so around two million African Americans move to the industrial centers of the North, the Northern states, and the Western states. Um, in the South, we have about a million um, African Americans that are moving from these rural small towns um, and communities um, from the farms, really, uh, to the industrial centers of the South. And that's exactly what Winston was at the time. We had around 80,000 population, around 80,000 people. Um, and uh, we were one of the biggest industrial centers of the South. And Winston-Salem, um, you know, we had tobacco and textiles. And so we think of Reynolds, um, really, the reason that Reynolds did real well, I mean, the, the Reynolds, they were, he was a, a very sharp uh, businessman and it was a very modern industry, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, he knew how to con conduct business, but it wasn't because he just had access to uh, cheap tobacco. It wasn't, that wasn't the thing, it was labor. It's why uh, Reynolds thrived here. And it was that, that uh, the labor force was really divided and the Jim Crow racism really worked um, to the benefit of these industrialists. Um, I need to go back a little bit before the 1940s because this strike that took place in the beginning of when Local 22, the, the unionization really took off was 1943 when there was a, um, a sit down. But before that, in the 1930s, you had all these wildcat strikes. It was a tremendous, uh, because of the depression, it was a tremendous unionization drive. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the major industrialists of the United States were pretty shook up by this. Um, and there was a lot, of, a lot of these strikes were really violent and they were put down violently, including in this state. Um, and so there was a concerted effort to have a counteroffensive and that's kind of the context of what happens in Winston-Salem with this union uh, drive that was led by these black workers themselves who were, were predominantly black and female. Um, something really unique though, this takes place in 1943. We usually think of the civil rights struggles that started later on in the 1950s <laughs> and the 60s. Um, but this was an integrated union. And that doesn't mean everything was just hunky-dory fine, but that's just a major thing to be in the South, to have an integrated union. And part of that is that you had this, the CIO was a much more left-leaning union. You, now we know of the AFL-CIO. Well, at that time, the CIO was an industrial union, which meant that everybody in the, uh, the industry was going to be um, you know, underneath this, this, um, this union. And they were inclusive, thinking that um, that the uh, black workers as well needed to be represented because you had many blacks had been very much um, for good reason turned off by union drives because it would be segregated and they weren't protected under um, the, uh, the unions such as the AFL where they really had they didn't they didn't gain anything by that um, so that's kind of the context you had a spontaneous sit down because one of the the workers was being treated unfairly in, uh, in the tobacco plant, these stemmers, which was the dirtiest work, some of the hardest work, um, which is the work that the, the black workers were given. Um, and these women had a, a sit down. You could say maybe it was spontaneous. I don't know about that. I think it was more like it just wasn't planned out, you know, that this is going to happen on such and such a day, such such a time, but they, they had to sit down and stop work because a co worker was sick 
wasn't able to leave her, she'd lose her job, couldn't support her family, so they had to sit down. And then from there, the, the union had already been organizing in the plant for several years, and they, um, they carried it, you know, the, uh, the unionization campaign forward, and at one point you had 10,000 folks in the street, and you had other industries in Winston-Salem that joined in. What ultimately, the uh, union was defeated, um, by 1950, Local 22 was no more that, as far as these, this, um, all the potential and everything it had, and there were a number of factors. Some of it was the, uh, the uh, anti-communist campaign, the Taft-Hartley Act, which was like an amendment to um, some, uh, the National Labor Relations Board, which was able to, or the Wagner Act, which was able to give some more rights um, for workers in the workplace and unions. Um, so they had some federal support, which helped these workers um, unionize plants in the segregated South. Um, but with the Taft-Hartley, you could say, okay, if there's a red, if there's a communist in the union, then um, they're out of, you know, they, they can be pushed out. And the CIO uh, kind of took the lead um, from uh, Truman and expelled most of the left-leaning unions. And so that was some of the, the one of the biggest pushes that, that um, defeated the union. And then there was mechanization. Some of the things we think about now were those jobs. It was much better during the strike for the company, for the rentals to uh, bring in um, you know, machinery to do some of these, these jobs that the black workers were doing. And so these black workers lost out. And at the same time, they rehired, uh, they replaced these workers with um, many white workers in the outlying counties, the surrounding counties um, around Forsyth. Um, and, you know, again, the, trying to pit um, a lot of the Jim Crow uh, racist beliefs to defeat the union as well. Um, you know, that thing that you hear a lot, but actually played out that divide and conquer type thing. So um, I think it, some big impacts on the civil rights movement would have been, would have been significantly different because the local 22 elected the first black alderman um, since uh, the turn of the uh, century was elected here, and that was due to Local 22. But I'm gonna let Erlene, who has had direct experience um, with one of the primary leaders of, uh, of Local 22, uh, Velma Hopkins, and I think you may have all kinds of things you can share with us about that, because she remained a leader, despite these folks being what, blacklisted? Black mm -hmm. right? Good afternoon. Thank you for such a great background leading up to um, Local 22. And I want some interaction, but this is really informal. Um, and it's such an apropos time uh, to talk about Velma Hopkins and her role with many other women uh, in the black community, because I understand this is International Women's Month. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's such an appropriate time to do this. But um, as uh, Will was talking about uh, some of the issues that led up to Local 22 and uh, the women that took the lead uh, in, uh, I, I want to say, uh, revolutionizing the conditions in which they were working, um, it, it really brought back some memories from um, sitting with Miss Hopkins, uh, Velma Hopkins, amazing with Miss Oshibel Little, who was the mother of Larry Little, Miss Estelle Fries, and many other <laughs> names of women that you don't hear a lot about. But um, I became um, very involved with Miss Hopkins because her activities from the 1940s in uh, helping this union and organizing the women and a few men, we had a few men, uh, for the union, uh, she became uh, one of the leading civil rights leaders uh, in Winston-Salem. Um, but one of the things she always said to me is that because she was an African-American woman, she had no education. Uh, that was always used against her. So she had to take what she knew best and to get it to work for her. So what she would do was surround herself with people that had more education, 
uh, had other kind of resources and she would use them out front. She said, I knew my limitations, but I knew what we had to do. So I wouldn't let uh, my being out front uh, stall the whole process. And that always stuck with me. A good leader <coughs> knows how to find people to get the job done. And that's what she was interested in because as I looked for pictures, and you won't see her in a lot of the pictures, but she was very much the driving force behind Local 22. And um, as a young girl around the age of 17 or 18, before I could even vote, one of the things that uh, black people faced in the community, they could not vote. That was number one. So uh, what Ms. Hopkins did, she recruited a lot of younger people like myself to work with older people to teach them how to read or how to recognize uh, certain things in the Constitution uh, so that they could register to vote. And one of the most vivid pictures in my mind is the, the store, the furniture store is still there on uh, 12th and Liberty Southern Furniture Store. It's where they had a voter registration drive and it was a white gentleman in coveralls and a plaid shirt sitting at a round barrel where African Americans <laughs> had to go up, give their names, and do whatever he asked them to uh, to qualify to be able to register to vote. And um, I, I never forgot that. I, for some reason, something was wrong with that picture uh, because he was not very articulate, um, but he had the right and was authorized to tell black people if they were able to register to vote. So my job under the um, tutelage of Ms. Hopkins was to help people to recognize portions of the Constitution, because that may be what you were asked to do, or to write your name. Uh, and many blacks at that time could not write their names. They was used to uh, doing an X. So, and uh, training us to help with voter registration, uh, she talked about some of the things that she had had to go through uh, as a black woman in this community. And one of the things, she had worked at R.J. Reynolds. And as Will said, it had, for years they have been trying to get a union, but as long as they could keep the workers divided, they were successful in, in doing that. Uh, but so after many years of working, they were able to get some white people to come into the union, uh, Local 22. And Will alluded to the fact that when the women or men got sick, the working conditions were awful. No, no air conditioning and no ventilation and people would actually get sick and start throwing up blood right there and there were no medical personnel to treat them. They would go to the bathroom, drink some water, and they have to go right back to work. So they, uh, the women decided that they just could not take uh, those kind of working conditions anymore in addition to the fact that black women and, and black men work side to side Black women were paid 50 cents an hour, and black men were paid 60 cents an hour. And the uh, labor grade white people may be paid 70 or 75 cents an hour. So um, the women just decided that it was not fair. They did the same <coughs> nasty, dirty, uh, inhumane work as everybody else and that they deserved. So uh, they would meet in churches around the black community, Shallow Baptist Church being one of those churches which Velma Hopkins uh, was a member of. And um, they began strategizing uh, how to get the community, uh, the workers at Reynolds specifically together um, to strike and to join the union. And how did they keep people from joining the union? They had death threats, threats of loss of their jobs, um, if, you, if uh, you had children, it was all kinds of things that they used against the workers to keep them from joining the union. So with fear in most people, and even though 50 and 60 cents, my Lord, we, we, we just can't even imagine working for that, 
those were pretty good wages for that day and time. So most people that had been fortunate enough to get these jobs, they wanted to keep them. But the working conditions became so bad that it was almost impossible. So they decided to strike. And in the meantime, um, the because of the organization and, and uh, Reynolds with the black workers, you had people like Paul Robeson, who was nationally known and uh, who was a communist, came to Winston-Salem uh, to support uh, uh, these Reynolds workers. So there was another opportunity for Papa Reynolds, and I don't know how many people, probably none of you all have heard that term, Papa Reynolds, uh, that was used in black community just consistently because, as Will said, nothing happened in this town that did not uh, have consensus for the boardroom of, of R.J. Reynolds. And even though you had people working at Haynes, some at uh, some of the other different places, decisions were pretty much pushed by Papa Reynolds. So, um, Ms. Hopkins talked about how she got death threats, um, how she was labeled as a, a communist, which was a word no one liked. So when they labeled her and some of the other ladies, Miranda Smith was another person that worked tirelessly. In fact, she ended up being ran out of town. She had to leave her family because of death threats and threats on her family. She left town. I don't know if Ms. Smith ever I, I don't know what happened to her. That was one of the things Ms. Hopkins would talk to a point about some of the people that had been involved uh, in the union and she wouldn't say much more about them. So there was so, I think people were actually maimed and they had to, to slip out the city at night uh, for safety of their very lives. So um, they labeled Ms. Hopkins Hopkins, Hopkins because they knew she was the leader. And they told the black people in the community that she was a communist and it was going to cause all kinds of horrible things to happen in the community. So guess what? That split the community. It kept them to divided. And we know if, if any group is divided, you cannot uh, get things done. So while they split the black community, half of the black community was against the uh, Reynolds work and workers organizing, and then there were the workers themselves that wanted to, to be a part of the union. And um, so Ms. Hopkins and them said they went through years of just trying to get fair wages. Uh, they, they talked about how um, when at lunchtime, they, I think it was 30 minutes for lunch, unless the straw balls or your supervisor and renters would say, okay, girl or boy, you've uh, had time to finish uh, the food in that bucket, come back to work. So it was just so many things that just led to, to thousands of people deciding that they were gonna go on strike. And um, so um, they were successful to a point, but finally because of the persistence and the tactics by R.J. Reynolds and some of the other um, leaders in the city, the union was busted. And we talked about a little bit of all of these years of struggling, trying to organize for better working conditions and better wages. Did any good come out of that? Yes, it did. Uh, workers would, what Reynolds did uh, they decided to increase the wages 10 to 15 cents. Uh, they started giving some benefits, um, improved the working conditions somewhat. Uh, and as uh, Will said, the, they started getting machinery in. So all in all, the, the cost of their efforts, people that worked and remained at Reynolds saw some improvements. Uh, until uh, the, fifth, uh, the 50s, I think, that um, Ms. Hopkins mm -hmm. said that they finally brought in some people and sat down and talked about 
what did the workers want to see? Uh, and in 1947, Kenneth R. Williams was elected um, uh, alderman, the first black alderman in the city of Winston-Salem. That came out of R.J. Reynolds calling in black people from the community and saying, okay, y'all tell us what black person that y'all want that we're going to see that they become an elected official. And that was Kenneth R. Williams, but guess what? And I love uh, uh, President Williams. He was uh, president of Winston Salem State University when I first went to school there. But he was the black person that they negotiated because he wouldn't make no waves. Mm -hmm. He was going to do exactly what the fathers of this city said mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. So there again, you had this division. So the, the black people, including Miss Hopkins, uh, accepted uh, Mr. Williams as that person that would be the first uh, black uh, alderman at that time, the city council now. So still, black people, even though there were some improvements, uh, they, I um, remember her talking about what we now call our human relations uh, commission was the good will of good human council. Anybody remember that? But it was a forerunner of the human relations council, which had five blacks or ten blacks and ten whites that would come together to talk about what would be good for the whole city. But the problem with, with that was the blacks that were selected were blacks that R.J. Reynolds and the leaders of this city could more or less control. There were some ministers, and I will not call their names because they did some good things. They had great intentions. But um, that was because of all the years and the struggles, even though we did not see a union in full blast here in North Carolina, in, in Winston-Salem, they did uh, make some differences in Winston-Salem for a while. Uh, because we are still now, in 2015, uh, have people working uh, for wages that's keeping them in poverty. We've been fighting for living wages uh, for years. So um, that's pretty much the story of Miss Hopkins and how she had to live her life in this community along with Miranda Smith, Maisie Woodruff. Maisie Woodruff went on to become the first black uh, that was elected countywide. She served on the uh, county commissioner and they said she can serve four years, and then the next four years somebody else had to serve. And that went on until about, uh, until the 80s, where we could get, when they did redistricting, where black people could elect their own representatives. So the union and R.J. Reynolds uh, have made a great, great impact on the life <coughs> of the black community. Um, one of the things Reynolds became um, noted for is that they got to a place where they paid a decent wage where blacks could move into middle class, send their kids uh, to college. But the workers in Reynolds soon became uh, so well paid that they made more than our school teachers. Okay. And that was because black women dared to sit down and to help make a difference in this community. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Yes, sir. Were there union movements in Durham and Richmond during the early 40s? Yes, there were. And in Rocky Mount, um, because of what was happening here in Winston-Salem, there were many efforts to start unions across the state. Uh, but there were also uh, uh, many what they call union bursting tactics that were used uh, by the leadership in, in different areas. Yeah, that's that's right. The Operation Dixie is the is what it was was called, and in, I think Wilson, Rocky Mount, mm -hmm. um, I believe Smithfield, Goldsboro, 
uh, quite a few of these Bay tobacco Bay. plants um, were, but there were other, in the South, there was, it was this big push in this Operation Dixie because, uh, you know, that, that's the, the weakness. I think this, this great book by Korstad kind of right. talks about some of the, the background <clears throat> and the context of, uh, of what went on with Local 22 and why it was so important as a labor thing, but that, you know, these big industries are capital. These, it's mobile. You know, they'll go where the cheapest labor is. Right. Um, or resources, you know, to get resources as well, but where that labor is cheap. And if, as long as you've got that weak link as far as the perspective of those people, the wage earners, um, you can always be pitted against somebody that will work for that much less. Right. And in Jim Crow America in the South, it's right there, you know, in the person that's working in the same factory. And these, these blacks knew that when you have no rights whatsoever, and that's why this, this you know, the name of that book is Civil Rights Unionism, but that, it wasn't just when it went on the a workplace like like Erlene has made very uh, clear. This was a, a community organizing effort that um, really initiated the civil rights. I don't think it started with, uh, you know, we talk about other factories. It wasn't just, not just other factories and other, other towns, but it was also rights out in the community that these, these folks were fighting for. It wasn't just a workplace thing. and, and um, and this Velma Hopkins, your mentor, I mean, uh, you know, that's a leader that, I mean, there needs to be just a, a movie and a book just about her. I, to me, a question I I think might be interesting uh, for you to um, kind of give us some perspective on, Erlene, is how after these folks, after it was defeated and these folks are blacklisted and some people had to flee and Velma stayed here, and how were these people able, because I've heard you talk about before how she continued to do things in, in other ways. Um, and I just think that's fascinating that it didn't stop and maybe the effects um, they had from a real, you know, looking at things from, a, from a people that had had such a strong experience from a proletarian civil rights right. uh, well, history. Well, one of the things, um, that Ms. Hopkins did, um, and, and as I mentioned, a lot of people, there's one person uh, that had a business, his name was Chick Black, and he had a dry cleaning business, and he had to flee his business uh, and leave this city. And um, so Ms. Hopkins started doing uh, things that generated her own revenue. Uh, because she was not going to be stopped. And as I said, it was, it became more difficult for her because they had sort of blackballed her and in the community tagged her as a communist in the black community, which was not a good word. So uh, she was a woman that was trying to do everything that she could to improve the community, but did not have full support anywhere. But uh, she continued to work, and uh, so uh, from her union activities spilled over into actually her becoming a civil rights activist. Um, I have a picture of her, um, <coughs> and I should have run more of these off and we can pass it around. But this is Velma Hopkins walking the first black student into Reynolds High School in 1957. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and as I started out, I talked to you about what uh, she was doing in terms of voter registration. Well, th there were many obstacles, too, because, again, Ms. Hopkins was the person that realized <laughs> what it was going to take for black people to get some equity and fairness was to be able to determine for yourself and one of the things were to be able to vote and to elect people from the black community. So even um, uh, Kenneth Williams, who was elected because <coughs> of Ms. Hopkins' uh, efforts, he was one of the people that would say, you all do not need to be um, dealing with your neighbors that are communists. But he was able to become the first black elected official because of the efforts of these people so um, because Ms. Hopkins went on, she opened a cafe and was able to generate her own resources, they were not able to just annihilate her, just 
make her go away. And that shows the strength that that woman had. I have so much respect because when you understand what she had to go through, being blackballed in her own community and uh, fearing, because I remember she talked about how many times they tried to threaten her husband uh, to control her. And of course, that didn't work. <laughs> um, and he had a job, so they feared that he might lose his job. But um, nevertheless, she went on, as I said, and did several things, um, took care of children in her home, um, went on to raise about 37 foster kids. So she did a lot of other things and became a civil rights activist and mentored young black folk like me um, to go out and do voter registration and to do civil disobedience um, so that her legacy still lives on because we today, because of Velma Hopkins and, and what started in Local 22, 22 uh, I directly relate to me being ele uh, elected the first black senator in this county. I mean, in 2015, we still seen first, but um, so um, she was just a strong woman that was determined not to be turned around, and, she, and what she did with the union turned into her being a civil rights activist and leaving a legacy that we still stand on today. What about the Second World War? Because many of the things you've talked about happened during the Second World War. Did that have any effect <coughs> or bad on what you were doing? Uh, it did. you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, if, if you like, I think um, <laughs> some of that would be because it was, there was a labor shortage, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which, you know, there were some factors there that worked on the behalf of Local 22, because we talk about how, you know, later on with uh, McCarthyism, but having a labor shortage, and, um, and then some of that federal uh, legislation with the Wagner Act, um, that allowed there to be some, um, they had some backing from the federal government um, when they would bring issues up as far as, um, you know, trying to unionize a, uh, a plant. And so those things help. And during the, what we're t I just think it's kind of fascinating that um, they were able to do this stuff, but you know, as far as it being, you know, not patriotic or anything. But you also got to figure, during World War II, what were we fighting against? Mm -hmm. Fascism. And uh, there's, a, there's a great book by, uh, oh, what's her first name, but Gilmore, and it's the radical Linda. roots of the- Glenda Gilmore. Glenda, that's it, yeah, of the Civil Rights Movement. And she talks about a lot of that. And many Southerners, including white Southerners, even looked at the Klan as fascists. They said those are our domestic fascists. And so it's pretty hard to run, you know, if you're a, a war, you know, for freedom and, and uh, democracy at the same time when you're oppressing these folks at home. So I think some of those things were probably... They, they, they did. And, you know, one of the other <coughs> things um, that I, I failed to mention earlier on in talking about cheap labor and migration of, of the sharecroppers uh, into the city was that um, for many, many years, we had what we call seasonal workers uh, that worked at Piedmont, back, uh, Piedmont Tobacco Leaf Company and Winston Leaf that would come into the city uh, and just spur the economic growth because they needed housing and meals and that sort of thing, but they could only work uh, from like May to September. Uh, so, and those workers were still paid less uh, than, than wor workers in rentals. Uh, and that was because they would leave the farm and come and just work seasonal work. So it was still a lot of things happening in between while there were some improvements in rentals in terms of working conditions and how people worked. and came into this city and helped make it the great city that it is uh, for very, very cheap labor. Now, I heard one time that R.J. Reynolds actually went uh, to South Carolina and brought workers. Was that, was that before the strike, uh, a result of the strike? Uh, uh, it was a result, no. and, and during the time of the organizing, that, that was one of the other tactics that they used uh, to put fear in the workers. <coughs> 
uh, to keep their jobs, would they would go out and bring these people in uh, to work, say, well, if you all don't want to work for 50 cents an hour, we'll just go somewhere and get somebody to work for even 40 cents. So it was during that time of, of the union organizing. Just sorry to interrupt. Just to clarify, R.J. Reynolds actually died in 1917. So there's, we're talking about two different periods of migration. There was an earlier period of migration where he did go out and actively bring folks in, but that that trend remained for decades. Actually, mm -hmm. bringing these migrant workers in. Sorry to interrupt. That. I have something else that is. I think might be interesting is uh, the the influence um, as far as the civil rights struggle of Local 22. I mean, there's obviously some things where it didn't have the same character as far as the um, people, uh, the working uh, class character and the, and the labor um, character that it would have had if, if the Operation Dixie had not been defeated, but also that you know, these gangs that took place, like in the NAACP, what we were the biggest chapter of the NAACP um, in North Carolina, that lo that was a credit to the union drive of wow. Local 22. Wow. And um, the people maybe that came, like of your generation maybe, that grew up around that, and those that were still living uh, members of Local 22, um, are, are there other people? Because I know that, um, you know, I was speaking with Representative Terry one time, and she talked about things that people that, um, that I guess she had had some contact, maybe it may have been um, Robert Black, Chick Black, who was a big leader in the Local 22, and then Roz Pellis <coughs> is probably around your age, I think, and, and she became a, a, an activist and an organizer, and then later uh, official in Washington, D.C. with AFL-CIO. But I, I, I don't know if there's people like that that you think, um, it's, it sounds like Roz was deeply in, influenced, but. Um. Right, and, and, um, and it's interesting that you said that she is now works back in North Carolina periodically working with the NAACP. Uh, but uh, I don't know of many people, Larry Little is still around, whose mother was one of the activists uh, in the union and one of the organizers. but. Um, I can't think of many. I, you know, and, and, and I, I'm sure that Miss Miranda Smith has some family. In fact, um, I think I read that she had a granddaughter, uh, but they will not talk about her involvement with the union, and that has always been a puzzle in my mind. Um, why some of the people that were involved, people refused to discuss why they left Winston or if. They left, you know, so uh, it makes me think some horrible things really went on. And mm -hmm. a lot of the families, uh, I'm sure, members, and because we don't talk about it, we don't know some of the family members that are probably still here, like Mr. Black and, and Miss Smith and some of the other people, uh, except Larry Little and his family. I know they are still very much. And Larry, the, many of you probably know that, but Larry um, was, um, uh, Black Panther, one of the founders of the Black Panther uh, Party here in Winston, and then later became a Winston Salem alderman. Maybe was that maybe late seventies or yeah, early eighties? In the late seventies, <clears throat> and uh, for a number of years, and um, and he talks about how I, I remember a story he related, um, and you may know the details better. But when the FBI, you know, they started a, a, a free breakfast campaign mm -hmm. and an ambulance campaign in the. Um, the black community here in Winston, but he talked about the FBI coming once to look into these these uh, Black Panthers that were supposedly so dangerous because they were trying to have the needs of their community met, right. and knocking on the door. I don't know if that was Velma Hopkins or it was one of the former local 22. It was uh, Miss Hopkins. It was it, and, and the FBI knocked on the door, and the story goes something like uh, what that they, they said, uh, hey, you know, there's some Black Panthers in the neighborhood, and. And she answered, well, how do you know I'm not a black man? <laughs> 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 and told her they made me out of here. Yeah. And, and um, one of the other stories I like about Miss Hopkins, because as hard as they tried to, to uh, assassinate her character and blackballed her, they ended up, uh, because she did have more community support in the black community for her than against her, 
uh, is that she was one of the people they had to call in for the negotiations. And um, anybody that remember Miss Hopkins, she was a woman that smoked, but she went in R.J. Reynolds' building with a pale mouth cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> How dare she? But uh, that was just the type of, and until the day, uh, I can't remember when she did it. And she made a point to let them know it was a pale mouth, because she was not going to support R.J. Reynolds uh, after all they did, um, you know, all of the horrible things and horrific things they did to the workers of the union. How long did the union last, and what is the right to work law? When were they, what, when we moved here in, in 70, I heard about that, but I never know what the background is. Well, um, the union never fully organized, and, and as uh, Will said, by the early 1950s, it, they had just really just gone away yeah. because they began to improve, like I said, the working conditions and uh, the salary, the wages of the workers. So uh, as they continued to do that, we elected our first black alderman, people began to not just deal with the union and, and say, well, we don't need that idea anymore because things are getting better. Uh, but as far as the right to work, in North Carolina. Uh, it is still a right to work state, which means that they could just about, you can be fired on a job just for anything. Uh, in fact, Tom <coughs> Tillis said uh, when he was elected speaker that North Carolina would be the best right to work state in the nation. And, and what exactly does right to work mean again? Uh, that means you can be fired at will. You have no rights as a worker. Pretty yeah, much. I'm real, that's not really correct. The right, right to work was a feature of the Wagner Act that said that states could opt out of requiring employees when a union does organize the plant. Employees don't have to be a member and don't have to pay. Okay. And, yeah, it was in, in, in a, in a, um, a state that is not right to work, uh, employees, if, if they're organized, the majority of the employees vote for the union, the union can get a contract that requires everybody to pay union dues or union security as, as a condition of employment. That's what it means. Right to right to right to uh, uh, wor working at will is is a feature of most states. Yeah. You can be fired if you're not organized. You don't have a contract. You can be fired for any reason. That's true in just about every state. What it does is it puts an obstacle. Yeah. Go ahead. One slight correction: the Wagner Act was in the Depression under Roosevelt. Right to work was not in the Wagner Act. It was Taft Hartley. Right. Yeah, exactly. and, and, and also, it, it is an obstacle because it makes it harder to organize. So I guess that's what, you, you know, I mean, many people, um, including myself, that work for a wage, we say it means you have the right to be fired and the right not to complain about it. That's what the right to work means, <laughs> you know, which means not a right. Um, it's very tough uh, to be in a right, quote, right to work state. Um, some of it, though, I think is, is just the idea that somebody's told you you're in a right to work state. You know, it's that state of mind that you really can't deal with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, more than maybe the idea that you, because people can, I mean, I, that's something that's so inspirational to me about Local 22 is how can we complain right now with these people? Obviously, they had some things. They had that federal legislation with the Wagner Act. And, you know, it was during wartime, but we've had wars since. We've had labor shortages since. We've had a lot. They had the odds stuck, you know, really stacked against them. And like uh, Chick Black, one of the leaders uh, as well, the active folks in the union said, you know, we're going to bring that giant down to earth. Mm -hmm. um, as he looked at the, the, you know, the beautiful Reynolds Tower that the Empire State Building was, was based off of. And they did for a time, you know. Um, so, I, I, you know, but that right to work is a real issue. Yeah, and, and, and it's so, to again, clear for me, please. It doesn't mean that this state doesn't allow unions. It means that if there is a union, you don't have to belong. Is that what you're saying? Or, it, yeah, yeah I think, and it's, it has to do with dues collecting as well, I believe. You don't have to um, pay the dues? Okay. I mean, like, one of the most recent outcrops <laughs> for right to work impulse was, was the state legislature in the last couple of years. Um, get, getting rid of the, the um, banning the NCAE uh, for, right. from right. having teachers uh, uh, pay pay into the association uh, directly through their paycheck. So right. I mean, it's a 
you know, it's a it's a cro it's a creeping and crawling impulse that's pushed forward in, in currently in Wisconsin. Yeah. State state employee unionization is collapsing onto itself because of a similar kind of change that Scott Walker's put through, and, and it makes it so hard then to organize from there. And they're seeing even, you know, I think it's just recently been in the New York Times that they're having even a harder time than they even expected with a simple change of a law where they can't collect money just to just do basic organizing. The meetings dry up, membership dries up, and um, and it's that it is that national right to work coalition that's pushing these laws. You know, of course, you know, you know who they're funded by. Alec, yeah. yeah. maybe. No. Pushing this forward. Yeah. 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 Y
and such a powerful victories that were made the, and later on in the 50s and, and 60s. However, you didn't have that that working class base and organization that had, it had started out with. And so it kind of truncated it to right. a degree and we're still... And you know, it's a lot of, of people my age uh, that can look back and you know, say, wow, there were a lot of gains, a lot of improvement, uh, but also because of some of those improvements and, and sort of some of the attitude change, uh, it broke up black communities and black business owners. We, people had began to have their own businesses, grocery stores, shoe shops, and that sort of thing. But as the wages went up and people were able to move out of the community, the businesses went away, they came through the East Winston community and put what I call a cement pond. Just <laughs> all the housing was gone. So the, the black community, we use that term, but uh, there is not the black community that we had in the days of R.J. Reynolds. Cause I, you don't see the black business people um, and, and the black businesses thriving, black uh, black Wall Street, as as we used to say. So, some mixed reviews uh, and feelings about that the change that occurred. I, I was wondering if either, either you could talk about um, you know I have the sense that I mean I think it's you know commonly talked about how in the in the early Cold War period, um, in, the, in the white working class, I mean, there was, there was certainly pressure nationally for, for women who had gone into the work for industrial workforce during the war to, to, back, to voluntarily leave the workforce. In some, way, in, in some cases, you know, the states mandated uh, women to, to not be the first to get the jobs and everything. And, and a gradual process of, of kind of you know discouragement, I think, just between men and women and sort of informal gender gender relations to uh, maybe men to sort of <coughs> discourage their wives from being agitators and in public in public life. And I wonder if if in the African American community, um, what the experience of these women who were involved in Local 22 was in terms of. Um, uh, feedback, uh, blowback they got they got from from men in the African American community about the propriety or wisdom or uh, you know just of of being public agitators. Um, well, I, I think I mentioned earlier that one of the things that they uh, some people had tried to talk to Miss Hopkins' husband about uh, mm -hmm. trying to control her and what she was doing wasn't good for the community and uh, that sort of thing. And um, one of the things in the black community, because of the times, if uh, the husband uh, didn't have work or whatever, for some reason they would sometimes migrate and leave the women. The women were the head of the household. So they had to be the activists. Uh, and if, if for some reason um, that there were uh, families that the man was working and usually usually the woman was, uh, you know, told what they could do, not, not work. I, I remember very vividly some of those families. But in, in most, a lot of the families, uh, the women were the head of the households. Uh, and uh, a lot of those women did what we call day work, or they worked for the Reynoldses, the Haynes, or the Grays, and many times had uh, more uh, income than the men, because the men were still not making uh, wages that were that great, or could not get jobs, because they were black men. So, and, and, and you will hear um, many times, in, in, a, in a lot of the labor movement, women, because after World War II, because of the shortage of workers, where women had to begin to go in, I was reading something about the shirt factories and that sort of thing where they went on strike. Uh, women had to become head of the households and, and make the decisions. I'd like to mention something. I grew up in Greensboro, and uh, we would often be going to see relatives in Davidson, and we would come through the, the 
the highway going through Winston. And it was just pitiful. It was just pitiful how the slums, the, the, the stench, the whole everything, and it was, it was because there was no sanitation. Uh, you know, there was no chance for these people. And it's just so wonderful and gratifying now that gradually, even though things, they're still problems, surely it's not, it, it's a far cry from the way it was then. And, and we thought, well, it's better to live in Greensboro than, you know, because we did have Bennett and we had, you know, the different uh, schools. But um, these things take generations, I suppose. But that was a terrible uh, flat, <coughs> you know, blot, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, at that time. And we always discussed it when we would drive through going to Davidson. And it was very, very sad. What time was that, please? That was in the 40s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the Monkey Bottom, is that the, the, when we saw that on the video, mm -hmm. Of the little child out mm -hmm. there, and it looked like there was a, you know, a stream and kind of washed. With, is that what that? You I think that's, that's the what Boston that? area. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure, because uh, now I was a young, I was a young and in the forties. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just I didn't really actually mean it like you were in there. <laughs> I, I, I wondered if you knew but I, I think from that. that was uh, part of the uh, what we call Boston, the Pond area which was a very impoverished area. <coughs> um, and, and one of the other things, uh, sometimes, I, as you ride through Winston now, we have some uh, signs that say like Reynolds Town, uh, Haynes um, had workers, and they bought houses in certain areas that their workers could live in. Mm -hmm. Reynolds did the same thing. Uh, so there, there was that thing of classism also with racism, where if you worked for a company and you had company housing, I think Haynes had a, uh, a housing out on off of Strapper Road back in that area called Haynes Town or something. And in uh, East Winston off of New Walker Town Road, they had an area called Reynolds Town. So, but they, we did at one time have some un inhumane living conditions, uh, not only here, but all over. Yeah, in Greensboro, well, the cones, you know, the, the, the cone wheels and uh, so it was, but this was very stark when we go through. Can I just ask, I was interested in the biographical note at the beginning that your, your, your family moved from Buffalo down down here. A lot more people heading the other other direction uh, at that, that time, a lot more African Americans heading to places like Buffalo. What, can, do you mind set, telling us about? What right here? I'm talking about World War II, too. My father went uh, when it, in, it was in the war. Oh, okay. And so um, my grandparents raised me here. My m mother and father went to Buffalo. But when my father went off to war, uh, my grandparents came and got me and brought me back, and that's how I'm still here. I still have sisters in Buffalo, family there. But uh, it wasn't the whole family that moved back. I wanted to uh, mention a little factoid here that um, during the, the union process, uh, Woody Guthrie came down here and uh, joined the picket line for a little while, and he was actually arrested um, because he wrote a, a picket line song that said, all color hands gonna work together, all color green eyes gonna laugh, all color eyes gonna laugh and shine, all color feet gonna dance together when I bring my CE. CIO to Caroline. So after he got arrested, though, he wrote another song about Winston Salem called Against the Law. And um, it's against the law to walk, it's against the law to talk, against the law to loaf. Um, let's see. Everything in Winston Salem is against the law. I'm a low pay daddy singing the high price blues. And uh, he never got a chance to record it, um, but uh, another. Billy Bragg, who is an Irish um, or an English uh, folk singer in a band called Wilco, recorded it, and um, just kind of like to the we, we corresponded with Wilco, with uh, Billy Bragg, that is, over the marker, and we were hoping he could, he was going to be in the state kind of close to that time, but he had to be at this other engagement, but we, we of course, had the letter, and 
and since he, he's the one who sang that Billy Bragg song, and we said, hey, um, we're in Winston, and it's kind of still against the law. Can you come here and be part of this? And he was pretty enthusiastic, but he just couldn't manage it. Um, yeah. So, so one of the things that's so striking about Winston story, which I think is an incredibly powerful story, is that it's really not represented in, in labor history, and so Will, I wonder if you can speak to why that is. And also because of, um, you know, for, for many of us uh, who have worked for um, justice and racial reconciliation in this community in a sense that things have been divided for so long, and yet there are these incredible moments in the history of this community where people came together and there was beautiful, powerful interracial work that happened. And and so early here, I mean, you know, so far um, before the Civil Rights Movement. And so I'm just curious what you all think about what, um, what are kind of some nuggets in this story that are relevant for us today? How can we learn from our history uh, and what's possible? And um, you know, selfishly, I'm saying this because I, I have a group of Salem women here who are students who are, are powerhouses and taking a community organizing and advocacy course, and I'd love for them to walk away with a real sense of what how we can learn from our history. You want to take the stand? <laughs> um, so well, why is it not in labor history, and what, what can we learn from our history? Well, I mean, I think the course test book, I guess, we'd say that's labor history, and, say, and that's really famous, but as far as you don't hear about like in labor, what a strong thing this was as far as the civil rights. Like we mentioned, uh, Glenda uh, Gilmore and and the radical roots of um, the civil rights movement, some things like that. But I, you know, that picture that's painted of the civil rights movement, it it really looks like okay, it all started with that that sit, you know, the, the refusal to take to give up her seat on the bus. Um, but so much more came before even her Rosa Parks work. But this this uh, proletarian, this worker-based civil rights work was was um, such a powerful thing. I think that the reason it's not talked about as much is that that was some revolutionary work that they were doing, and that's um, you know the report just comes out on Ferguson. Hmm. It, you know, it's such a clear thing that we did, everything wasn't accomplished, not that anybody here need to hear that, but um, it was worker-led is what that was about. And that's very, uh, that's a very threatening thing. It's not, like we said before, it wasn't that the wages just had to get higher, it's the rights, you know, right. to, to win these rights. And so, and King even talks about that, that, you know, this civil rights movement, he said, you know, this is about universal rights, and when we have an economy that, is built on exploitation, then you have something you've really got a bigger problem with. Which I think is another of the big stories from this experience because we certainly are seeing the, right, the rights of the worker diminished today by corporations and they will do what they need to do because to, their, their goal is to make money. And I think the organization of people the, the, this, this little city, you know, which managed to get some more rights for the workers, even though you were just didn't last that long, you organized and you stood up for yourselves. And I don't think we, people today think about that, that they have some power if they, I wish they would make a movie uh, about Miss Hopkins, Delma Hopkins. Norma Brady was a big success. And racism is just as relevant today as, exactly. as it was. And, and you know, one of the things, and, and Will <laughs> talked about this earlier on, uh, even the unions were segregated at one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when a Local 22 began to get white workers, that was another thing to deal with because you were bringing people together uh, instead of keeping them divided and separated. So one of the things is that when we work together, you know, you may live on one side of town and I on the other side, but if we're both making low wages, don't have health care, then we have something in common to come together to work with. And that was, would be one of the things that I would hope people would see, that when blacks and white came together to work together, 
not only in the union uh, movement, but in the civil rights movement. It, it started to really make a big difference. Thank you, Dr. Hen. I wanted to add to uh, what uh, um, one of the participants was saying about um, uh, the fact that these that these uh, strikes were not have been sort of kept out of the public eye, and I think that's been a really sy systematic thing. Um, I don't know if uh, many of you remember, but back in the 90s, there was a nationally televised public uh, television uh, documentary on the textile uh, uh, regional textile strike in the 30s, and that was actually kept. They actually uh, changed the time uh, here in UNC to 11 p.m. And I know that was that was you know a lot of the powers that be that were behind that because it was this, it was it was it was uh, prime time everywhere else. So this I really think it's been a, a systematic you know attempt to keep this union history, especially from the South, that really needs it the most now, um, you know, from the public life. So I don't know if you have any other thing to add to that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about that is that, that union strike, one of the most powerful things about the documentary was the fact that uh, Jim Crow was such a, a major instrument of defeating that strike and, and the textile truck strike in the 30s. You said it very well. <laughs> yeah, and just, just to uh, repeat to some degree what you were saying earlier, and I think those things of the unity aspect is the the power behind this and also the symbol and Tony that's probably why you know the idea that not just the unifying of, of uh, black and white and workers and some of these more progressive liberal but um, you know foundations and institutions that also saw the need to do this that weren't actually laborers that actually you know um, that were willing to support to some degree um, that unity is, is really, I think, is what the big threat is, but also the unity of rights, you know, that it wasn't just in the workplace, but your right to vote, your right to have a say on the street, in your neighborhood, your living conditions, um, you know, the, to say these are universal rights, that we already have these rights, you need to respect them. Um, and it, wow, doesn't that seem just as relevant today? Yes, is relevant today. Well, Glenda, that's a good input. I want to thank our um, guests for participating and to say thank you. I have a framed photo of what the local um, 22 strike for Will. And then for thank Arlene, so we've got an, uh, a photo of her when she was crowned Miss Pickle from then <laughs> 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 NCSA, North Carolina School of the Arts. And what year, would Mike, do you know what year this was? 71. Yeah, so that's this. There's actually another photo behind this one of you actually getting the crown, but that one, this is a better photo. Thank you. You're very welcome. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. We do have surveys that we left on your, uh, on your seats. If you have time, please fill them out. Give us your email address if you want to hear about upcoming events. And we'll have a, a red basket in the back that you can put it in. Thank you so much.